can argue that every one of you in this room, this relates to. Whether or not you're in business, you've got a new product or an idea for a product that you want to get out to market. Maybe you already have an existing product that you want to improve on. Maybe you want to sell someone on your idea or your point of view. Maybe it's just getting a partner to go to a particular restaurant and influencing that decision. Whether you like it or not, each one of you does market research and selling every day, whether you realise it or not. If you're able to do effective market research, you'll be able to do all of these things. You'll be able to work out what your customers' problems are, what features and benefits you should be offering to them, and what really speaks to them, any concerns they have, the precise offer and price that you should be giving someone, the right marketing channels, and much, much more. That's my big promise for this presentation in the next 15 or so minutes. In my experience, doing effective market research is the number one thing you can do to ensure that your product that you launch is going to be a success. Nothing else matters. This is the number one thing. If you get this wrong, everything you do after this does not matter. All right. So I'm going to give you a brief um, history of my story, how it relates to market research, and why you should listen to me. Kick it off with a story back 2011. I heard of an event called Startup Weekend. Now, Startup Weekend is a 54-hour event that starts on a Friday night, and then two days later, it ends on a Sunday night. The whole objective of the Startup Weekend is to launch a new product, create it, go sell it to people, and then people pay you real money for what you've just created. So Startup Weekend came to Sydney in 2011. I flew over there. I competed in the event with one of the teams. About 10% of the participants that went through that event were able to do what I just said. Build a product, sell it to real people, and get real cash in their, in their pocket in 54 hours, two and a half days. The biggest lesson for me out of that was I was able to achieve so much more in one weekend than I was to be able to do the whole previous year. I procrastinated, I didn't set deadlines, I concentrated on the wrong sorts of things. I got so much value out of that event, a colleague of mine and myself, we brought that event to Adelaide. We started speaking to people doing our market research. And someone, I remember distinctly them saying to us, you won't get more than 10 people to come to this event. We said, oh, really? And we did a lot of market research that I'm going to talk about um, in this presentation. We ended up selling out that first event with 80 people. We've done another five events since then, selling them all out with 100 plus people. Over the last four years, I've launched five other products under 100 bucks, and they've all been profitable. As I said, we've run five other startup weekends. We've had 500 people gone, gone through that process. I was to help Flinders Uni with a program called Venture Dorm, which is a three-month um, three program, not a two-week one. We've had 100 people go through that. We've run that four times. So out of those 600 people that have gone through this learning, some of them, about 10 of those companies have gone on to raise capital, and their combined <coughs> valuation is six, $6 million. bucks. So this whole thing is entirely repeatable. In this next section of the presentation, I'm going to go through some buying psychology, how people make buying decisions, and how that relates to market research. This is the theory stuff. There are, there are some gold gems in there, so please don't go to sleep. So what is market research? It's the organised effort to gather information about your customers. It's pretty broad. What does that actually mean? For everyone in this room... That relates to business, that relates to your career, that relates to personal life. Maybe you're asking your boss for a pay rise. Maybe you want to get your partner to go to a particular restaurant. Maybe you want to launch a new product. As I said before, everyone in this room, this relates to you, no matter what you're doing. Kick it off with a case study. Amazon, everyone knows that Amazon, they use this process called working backwards. Whenever they create a new product, if it's externally for you and I when we buy a book from Amazon, or whenever they create a product internally and they've got to sell it to their team, 
they have this policy that they put, they they call called working backwards. Every one of their employees needs to go through it. You start with your customer, and then you work out the minimum set of features they need to satisfy what you are trying to achieve. Start with your customer and work out what they need before you go out and create anything. Practically what this means for them, they write the press release, whether or not it gets published, they write the frequently asked questions, and then they write the user manual. All well and truly before they start any product creation, whether it's external or they need to win over something they can. Very important, and I want you to um, take this into consideration with everything else that I talk about. When you're doing a sales presentation, and let's not just look at sales as strictly selling a product, selling an idea, a point of view, you're selling a pay rise from your boss, whatever it is. You talk about your credentials, you talk about your benefits that you're going to offer them, you're going to talk about calls to action. Everything that you do in that conversation when you're selling needs to relate directly back to the market research that you're doing. Does that make sense? This is the most important part of my presentation. If you take nothing else from today, it's this quote, and I'm going to repeat it. Enter into the conversation that your prospect is having in their own mind. Just read it and let it sink in. Enter into the conversation that your prospect is already having in their own mind. What's the internal dialogue, the worldview that they already have? How can you get into that conversation and understand what's going on in their life? Humans, they love this condition called homeostasis. It sounds boring, it's a scientific um, term. It's a condition that remains stable and relatively constant. Homeostasis, it's your comfort zone. Humans are also two times as motivated to move away from pain than they are to go towards pleasure. So if I have a hundred bucks in my pocket, I'm two times more likely to keep it there than give it to someone else. A guy named Abraham Maslow came up with Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know the big triangle with the many layers? All of those bottom layers are about avoiding pain, seeking shelter, seeking food. All of the above layers are about seeking pleasure, self actualization. This is what happens when someone goes and purchases something. You, me, everybody here, we all do this. This is the logic that goes behind the scenes. We have a pain or a problem. It means we are no longer in homeostasis. It means we are outside our comfort zone and we'll do anything possible to get back into that comfort zone as fast as we can. We all do it, self-included. It also means we're highly motivated to go out and find a solution to get us back into our comfort zone. And we're highly motivated to talk to people about that. Which is good news for you when you're doing market research. People are willing to tell you about what situation that they are in. When you're doing your sales, you should be mirroring the exact phrases that people tell you when you're talking to them about their worldview. Don't tell them something that they don't want to hear. It won't register for them. What you want them to be saying is, yes, whatever you're presenting to me is exactly what I need. They're outside their comfort zone and they want to get back in. Let's go deeper down the rabbit hole. Humans love instant gratification, don't we all? The reason is, and I've been saying it over and over again, people want to get back into their comfort zone when they're out of it. People only see the value that you're presenting them. They never see the opportunity cost. Obviously, the opportunity cost is the alternative path that you're going down. Now, who could blame them? They only see the value that you're presenting them because they're focused on getting back into their comfort zone. They will miss the opportunity cost or any opportunity cost that is involved. All right, MRI scans. What happens? When people are, um, get under MRI scans, is they have a thought, they then take action, and then seven seconds later, they have a conscious thought of exactly what just happened. It's never the other way, other way around. 
Some people think you have a conscious thought and then you take action based on it. It's not how it works. It's not how it works for me. It's not how it works for everybody. It's called confabulation. Confabulation is where people create a story and then rationalise what's happened after the fact. Does that make sense? It also means people love to buy, but they hate being sold to. People love to buy based on so, um, the biology. It's based on their emotions. It's based on their past. And people being sold to, you're just logically trying to convince them. People love to buy. It means they're in homeostasis. They're back in their comfort zone. They get a self-esteem boost. When people are being sold to and they hate it, they have no pain or the urgency. You're trying to convince them and that's good with them. Everyone's probably being through that way. You're trying to convince someone to buy something or buy your idea, and that's the reason. <coughs> so, Diva, humans love the magic pill. Everyone wants something yesterday. No one likes to put proactive effort into anything and wait for years or months for anything to come. They want it yesterday. The biggest lesson for all of you here is sell people what they want, not what you want to sell them. This all comes back to market research, getting into the conversation that's already happening in your prospect's mind. All right. Here's all the instant gratification stuff. The magic pills for you guys, the how-to step-by-step doing this. Everyone in this room, no matter if you're selling a product, you're trying to improve a new product, pay rise, trying to convince someone to go to a restaurant, all of you will be able to do these two things. Get a prospect list. If you're in business, you're going to have a prospect list of hundreds of people. If you're trying to convince your spouse to go to a restaurant, your prospect list is of one. Next step, what you want to do is ask the following six questions. <coughs> what are their biggest challenges with X? And X is whatever their problem or their the situation they find themselves in. And what results are they trying to achieve? Give you a good insight into the benefits that they want. For example, I have a headache and I want to get rid of my headache. It's my biggest challenge and what I want to achieve. I have a headache and I want to get rid of it. Super simple example. What's the magic pill? They think, not what you think, they think will achieve this. Give you an idea into the product type. So I have a headache, I want to get rid of it. The magic pill I think will get rid of this is taking a painkiller. Right? If they can solve this immediately, how much would that be worth? Well, I know I can go down to and, um, and buy a pack of Panadol and it's going to cost me four bucks. If you come out with a new product that's painful that gets rid of a headache for my problem, probably giving you a price range by speaking to people. I'm going to tell you, right? Where and how are they able to solve this? Give you a really good idea into marketing and sales channels. They're looking for a painkiller. They're going to go down to the chemist to buy, buy something from there. If you're doing Facebook ads or Google ads for painkillers, you're probably using the wrong marketing channel because that's not what they're already using. What are you considering buying already? Give you an idea of the value proposition you need to bring to the table and what their current perceived options are. What will happen if they don't get this solved? <coughs> to give you a good insight into their motivations and their concerns. 